One of the things that um, I find is that people think they should be further on than they are. And because they think they're further on than they are, they aren't. And everything's done by faith. And um, faith is the ultimate, uh, and it's faith that works by love. And what, what Christians don't understand is, as I said um, on my previous uh, meeting on Thursday, um, when you have a baby delivered, you know, not by a stork, but you know, you, a baby's born, um, that baby is complete. There's nothing you need do. The child is complete. You don't go after two months and go down to the dentist to get false teeth. You just abide. The baby gets balance. Um, it gets um, control of its um, extremities and, you know, and you can train it and then you educate it and then you grow up. And all in life, one of the things I've found in Christian circles is everyone is trying to be what they're not because they're told that if you pray enough and you read your Bible enough, you can go to the next level, um, which I find absurd. Um, but that is the kind of doctrine that people are taught. So if you fast and pray, you read your Bible enough, you can go on into ministry. Well, the truth is you can't. So let me just make that plain. You can only go on to do what God called you to do and equipped you to do, and you will go no further than that. In the same way that a child, when it's born, um, it'll grow up, but not every child becomes a concert pianist, nor do they have the ability to. Not every child becomes a scientist, not every child. Everyone has different capabilities as a gift from God. And what has happened in Christendom, there is this evil notion of equality, which does not exist. There is no such thing as equality. Um, everyone has a genetic endowment given by God. God plans you out. He, it says in my Bible that before you were in your mother's womb, he planned everything out. And when you're born, you're born with uh, a capacity within you to accomplish certain things. Now you can use your abilities to the maximum or sometimes to the min minimum and sometimes not at all. But inside of you is the whole plan of God's um, purpose for your life. And um, I'm talking of Christians now and that purpose will be fulfilled. Uh, but it will be fulfilled only to the extent that you <coughs> acknowledge that God is the creator and you acknowledge his sovereignty. Um, if you think and you have ambitions of your own, you will thwart the purpose of God in your life. The whole purpose of every Christian is to live according to the will of God, not live according to their will. And the biggest problem in Christendom today is selfish ambition, which is birthed out of false doctrine, which is that you can do it. Well, you can't. There's a lot of things you cannot do. Um, I will never be an opera singer. Um, why? Because my capacity for singing is somewhat minimal. Uh, now, you, you can say, well, you could develop it. Yeah. But it's not really my realm, nor am I a pianist, uh, nor am I um, an artist. You know, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, and I'm not very good with my hands. Now, I could develop it, but, uh, you know, it's just not my ability. I have my ability in other areas, which I won't mention. Um, but everyone's got abilities and giftings. And so when you start looking at scripture, um, Paul, the very practical person, actually wants you to understand what your giftings and abilities are and to develop those and to see why you should develop them. 
because there's always a purpose in God. God's not mindless, uh, as people think God is mindless. God has planned everything out, and the Bible says that he orders all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, if he's planned a purpose in your life, he intends you to fulfill that purpose. Now, you can fill it with joy, or you can fill it with misery, but you will do what God says. That's it. Now, that's why he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we go on in uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I want you to really, I want to repeat some of the things I said on Thursday. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, that is a statement of fact. Not a statement of theory, it's a statement of fact. Um, I'll repeat it. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Now, here it's saying, look, your whole purpose, your focus, everything in your life has got to be heavenward, not earthward. And you're to seek those things which are above. Now, he then goes on and enumerates what they are and tells you how to do it. And it's a practical lesson. The Bible's always practical. But because people take verses out of context and make a pretext of them, the people get mixed up and they lose sight of what God really intends. Now, having said this, as I said on Thursday, he goes on, verse 5, mortify, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now, and... What, what is very clear is, look, you're in Christ. You've got to seek those things which are above. And all the things he says you've got to put to death are the things of the earth. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. People covet things, um, and jealousy and envy and covetousness is probably the largest motivator in the world. Um, and you, you'll find that evil man Obama over in America called President. <laughs> um, he actually is after getting people angry at people who've got money. Now, he's got money. He's a thief and a crook and a liar and a cheat and vile, and filthy, and devil-inspired. And there's nothing good about Obama. He, he just let four people be butchered by terrorists. He supports all the things that are wrong. And uh, murdering unborn children, that's murder. Um, Full-term abortion, that's wrong. Um, everything he supports, I am totally against, because he's against God and he belittles God. In fact, I think he thinks he is God um, in his own stupid way. But the fact is that there he goes and his mind is set on earthly things. It's amazing when New York, that terrible storm came, people lost their homes, they lost their, everything they had, was swept away in the storm. So he goes there for a photo opportunity before he goes off to Las Vegas. Um, and what happened? People are left with no electricity, no water, no food, no clothes, 
And what's he doing? Messing around, pretending he's a great president down in um, Las Vegas, but he's left the people and forgotten the people that are suffering. Now, if he was a real president and he had any genuine sympathy for people, he'd have done something about what's going on there. He'd have called the army and he'd have called people in to come and relieve the people who are suffering. Not a bit of it. What they get is an 800 number to ring. And what good's that? But that's him. Uh, thank God there are Christians and Christian churches, not Muslim churches like his, but a Christian church that will actually do something about it and are going out and helping people in small groups around the place. There's something wrong, and that's society. Um, people are more concerned with things on earth than things in heaven. They're not concerned with pleasing God, they're concerned with pleasing themselves. And I just pray, I, I don't know what will happen. Uh, I think if God's judgments upon America, they'll get Obama back for another four years, which would be a living hell. Uh, he's an evil man. Um, is Romney any better? Anything's better than Obama, anything. Uh, and as for Biden, well, he's a buffoon. Um, and God will judge them because there'll come a day of reckoning. Uh, you know, people say, oh, you shouldn't be political. I'm not being political, I'm being factual. Um, and there's a great difference. I don't care for a man's politics, um, but socialism is based, and what Obama is, it's based on the hatred and covetousness and what is stirring up is hate for anyone who's successful. Um, they should pay more. Pay more for people not to work, pay more for food stamps, pay more for unemployment. The reason they're unemployed is because of his idiocy in running the economy down and outsourcing jobs to China. And, and yet the media lie. And why do the media lie? Why don't people tell the truth? Christians should tell the truth and they should face people up. And, and if you say that, they get angry. It's nothing to do with racism, it's to do with God's principles. Goes on, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Uh, it says in the NIV, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God um, is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. Um, and we have to understand that, you know, God's wrath comes on the children of disobedience, it says in the authorised version. And, and the wonderful thing is, you're not a child of wrath. God's wrath isn't coming on you, because grace has come. Now you've got to deal with things in your life. You've got to put to death, which means all you do is you don't give in to the things that will destroy uh, your walk with God, you obey what God says. Is that plain? There's no way you can lose your salvation. You're already in Christ. You're already buried with him in baptism. You've risen with him. And so don't ever get the idea you can lose what God's done. You can't. It's done. It's eternal. But what you've got to do is realize, I can't live like the world live. Sorry, I, I, I can't run that way. And so he said, you've got to put to death those things. Now you've still got your human nature, you've still got your carnal desires, you've still got things, and you've got to be careful, you don't give in to those, you, you put them to death, no, that's not part of my life anymore. Now you have a choice. You can run with the herd and pretend, but you're still a Christian, and if you run with the herd, it's going to hurt you but seek those things which are above, okay? Then it goes on, and this is what I love. It makes it so simple. Uh, but now, you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds 
and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, one of the things you've got to understand is that uh, I was speaking with um, a couple who came to see me last night, and um, they were shocked and, and were saying, well, you know, the Jews are God's people, and therefore you've got to learn about the Jews and their customs. And I said, not at all. A Jew is not God's people. That is a lie of the devil. Paul said, they're not Jews that are Jews outwardly. It's the Jews who are Jews inwardly. There's a lot of people who claim to be Jewish um, and claim a heritage, but it doesn't benefit you at all. Being a Jew or being a Gentile is of no relevance, according to Paul, who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. Look, he, he had to face the fact that Judaism was not of interest to God. So you don't get any brownie points for being a Jew. Uh, there, there is no way that it makes any difference. Well, this person last night, oh, no, no, they're God's people, so they're special. No, they're not special. According to Paul, Christ is all in all. And that's it. And so when you see people put on little skull caps and get prayer shawls like the Jews and, and start having little feast days and going into all that nonsense, that means they've fallen from grace, they're no longer Christians, and they're setting themselves against God and outside the principles of God. Is that plain? Hello? Yes. Uh, and so often... You, you think, well, how can anyone be that stupid? Well, that's their gift. It says this. Um, okay. Um, verse 11. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore... As the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Now, it, it's so important to understand that you are the elect of God, you are holy. That's what God says. Now, it doesn't matter what man says. God's opinion of you and what God says you are is the only thing that counts. Now you say, but there's all kinds of things in my life that need sorting out. Quite right. But that doesn't alter the fact of what God has made you in him. So you just have to face the fact God's report is the one that counts. Man's report is the one that doesn't matter. And I'm all for God's report. Uh, there's a song we used to sing, whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. God's report's very good. Now, when you look at a person, you can say, well, goodness me. Um, if God's report is that, he's got it wrong. No, he's got it right. You've got it wrong because you judge by earthly values, earthly standards, but you should be see seeking those things which are above. Uh, you, you shouldn't be in the flesh looking at the fleshy things. You understand what God says and you believe what God says. And it doesn't matter, you know, there's, there's so many people get hooked up on 
judgmentalism. Uh, and, well, you know, how could he do that such a thing? Simple. He's human. And all of us have the capacity of humanity. Well, there are exceptions here, but most of us have the capacity of humanity. Um, we're human. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. And we need to realize that even though we have this treasure in an earthen vessel, we don't have to yield to the earthen vessel. And if we do yield, it still doesn't alter our state in Christ. I am a son of God. You are a son of God. You are a child of God. You are holy. Why? Because he is holy. You are redeemed. Why? Because he shed his precious blood. You are free. Why? Because he bought your freedom. You are forgiven. Why? Because he took your sin into his own body on the tree and God cannot hold someone guilty when the price has been paid. Is that plain? So the, uh, the handwriting of ordinances has been taken out the way. He nailed it to his cross. It's over. And, and there's nothing will ever stop you from being what God says you are. Can't. And that is where faith comes in. You see, I believe God. I believe God's word. I believe God's calling. I believe God's truth. And I'm not interested in what man should say. Now, you say, well, do you live in an a unreal world? No. God's word, world and God's word is real. And man's is false. Um, how can Jesus have died 2,000 years ago and taken all my sin into his own body on the tree and all your sin into it on the tree, died to it all, rose the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and when he died, I died. When he rose, I rose. When he ascended, I ascended. I'm seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I've set my, thing, my mind on things above. How can that be? Well, it's all by faith. God had faith that when he went to Calvary and when Jesus bled and died on Calvary, he had enough faith for your sin and my sin to take it into his own body, to die to it all and to believe that there'd come a day when you and I would totally understand and come into life. Now, what the devil tries to do is to nitpick his accuser of the brethren. So all he wants to do, he uses people called Christians to accuse you. Well, if you were really who you say you are, you wouldn't do this. If you really had met God, you wouldn't do that. Well, it's irrelevant what man thinks. It's relevant what God says. So you have to look at God. Has he really forgiven me? Yes. Am I holy? Yes, he says so. You say, well, do you just, be I believe it. That's what faith is. I believe everything God says about me because it's true. Because God cannot lie. So if you're living a lie, it doesn't make it true. It just means you're living a lie. You're holy. <laughs> you have been forgiven. It's all true. And, and the devil spends his time accusing and using Christians to accuse, to bring you down from the position God's put you in. That's why people don't progress in their Christian walk, because the just shall live by faith. And there's a very great difference. Now, I'm talking of born-again, spirit-filled Christians. I'm not talking of religious people. Religious people, they're no more saved than a mackerel. And I don't know why mackerels get the blame. Um, but there you are. And above all, verse 14, put on the, um, these things, put on charity, which is a bond of perfectness, or... Uh, when you look at it in um, the NIV, it says, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. 
Now, one of the things that's destructive in the body of Christ is schism. And schism comes, or division comes, because people get ideas, and those ideas are crazy ideas very often. Um, and you can, you can get a truth that isn't a truth. Let me give you a for instance, okay? Someone came to my house last night and they went on about, ah, you know, when you pray, you've got to really cry out. Okay, fine. Show me the scripture. Well, Jesus cried out at the Garden of Gethsemane and he was heard for his strong crying. Correct. Nothing wrong with that. Except one thing. When Jesus got to the Garden of Gethsemane, he was looking at having to take your sin, my sin, and the sin of the whole world into his own body on the tree. He, who was totally holy, pure, divine, was looking at becoming the very thing he hated most, sin. And he was going to take God's punishment for that sin into his own body, called crucifixion. Now, when his humanity saw the enormity of the task, he cried out and was heard for his strong crimes. When was the day that you had to face the fact you were going to bear the sin of the world? Never. When was the day that you were horrified that everyone's sin was going to be dumped on you and you were going to take the wrath of God into your own body to pay for the sin. of You never ever were confronted with that. So don't then go and make your prayer life based on what Christ faced because that's absurd. You never faced it and never will. He died and he went in our place so we wouldn't have to die. He came to give us life. So if you're one of those who say, ah, oh, well, Christ, you know, he it was hurt. And then you go into a, a, a mad, um, what, insane house, and they're all, ah, God, ah, and they're all rolling on the ground shouting and stuff. Well, let me tell you what happens. Um, Paul says, when people come in, they'll think you're lunatics. And, and I go into some churches, and I think the people are lunatics. Look, I don't cry out, and I'm, I'm not going to bear anyone's sin, thank you very much. Jesus bore it. Uh, and the idea that we are got to pray in that way, uh, I, I always give the example, you know, I was married for a long time, 44 years or 45, I can't remember. Um, but one of the things is, I never ever went to my wife. I need a cup of tea! I, darling, I'd love a cup of tea, you know. Uh, you, you, if, if you start husband and wife screaming at each other when you want something, and here's a loving heavenly father who loves us. I'm a child of God. What on earth am I shouting in his left ear hole for? Screaming, oh God, as though I haven't got a relationship. If I'm a child of God, I don't treat God as though he's somehow obscure. I hardly know him. I, I just come and I know that he loves me. I know he hears me. I don't have to shout. Uh, if you start shouting, you know, um, the Jews did because their God was in the temple or in the tabernacle. And, and basically, they saw a God of thunder and light. I see a God of love. They saw a God of judgment. I see a God of grace. I can come to him and I can have boldness to come to the throne of grace because he loves me. He paid the price. I can come through the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, without any condemnation, any guilt. Any... So I'm not coming to God and ranting. You know, there was a group called the Ranters who really affected the um, Quakers in the early days. And they came, and they went berserk. They went bananas. Look, 
Paul says, if I come into the church and everyone's speaking in tongues, he said, the unlearned, that means a non-believer, going to look at you and say you're all mad. And that's the truth. And you go into some churches and you, you think they need a man in a white coat to look after them. They're all going, blah, blah, blah. and they're looking at the walls and shouting at the wall. Well, the wall's not going to do anything. God's not in the wall. <laughs> God's in your heart. God lives in you. And, and we need to come back to sanity in the church. Uh, people go and, and they think if, if you scream and you shout and you determine, that God's going to hear your prayer. He said, I'm fed up with your vain repetitions. That was what Pharisees did. Uh, and we need to get balance back. And so he just said, look, he, here's the way to do it. It's by love. You know, the easiest way to get God to do something is to acknowledge his love for you. Lord, I don't deserve anything, but you love me. Jesus shed his blood for me. Jesus rose on the third day and justified me. Lord, and then you let your request be made known with thanksgiving, not with shouting, not with panic. Do you know the easiest way for people to manipulate you is to work you up emotionally? Uh, and that's what they do in churches. They get on your emotions and they sing sloppy songs. I want to love you more. I want to... Oh, really? Grow up. Um, I, I, you know, you don't go to your wife and say, I want to love you more. Uh, you, you know, that's just stupid. You know, she should give you a good slap around the face and say, stop being a turkey. Uh, I mean, you know, it's just not right. That's not how life is. Well, your relationship with God. You know, Christ has come for a bride. Now, if the bride is going to be a bellying old fogey, he's not going to be very happy with that bride. He loves us. We love him because he first loved us. So we need to get it into biblical perspective and we need to get a little sanity. One of the things that's so important, I was saying to Aidy um, this morning, is that when you get into an emotional state, rationale goes out the window. Uh, that's why you've got that evil man, Obama, getting people worked up, screaming and shouting. Now he's talking about, vote for revenge. Revenge? That's one of his statements. People don't vote for revenge. They should vote for the good of the nation. They should vote for someone's got integrity. What re what's revenge got to do with it? Well, if you're a Muslim, I suppose that's the way you think. But if you're a Christian, it's a God of love, not a God of revenge. And, and you don't go to your wife and try and get revenge. You know, you, you got, that's why you've got to forgive. That's why he makes it very plain. I love the scripture, it just makes it plain. And, you know, it's... Um, and above all these things, put on charity, that's love, which is the bond of perfectness. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, when you're emotionally stressed, the last thing you can do is make a rational decision. You don't. Once your emotions are high, you don't... That's how Hitler got the Germans to follow him. That's how Stalin destroyed the whole nations. Why? He got emotion. You know, they've got something, we should have equal rights. And that became destructive because it was built on covetousness, hatred and jealousy and envy. And anything that does that is wrong. We should be people of peace. The peace of God that passeth all understanding. If you're at peace with God, you can't come to God and say, No! You, I mean, that, that's not peace with God. That's anxiety in the extreme. I, I can't come like that. I, I've often sat in places where everyone's having a good old shout, and I'm thinking, oh. And I've been in places where they've got all emotional, 
and God's got so bored with it, he's come and had a chat with me while I'm sitting there watching these idiots jumping around, prancing and demanding of heaven. And God says, well, you know, no one's listening to me. Um, and so he comes and talks to me, tells me a lot of things. You know, it's in quietness. Do you notice one of the things Elijah discovered, it, it's not in the storm, It's not in thunder and lightning. Actually, it's a still small voice. And you have to come to rest first before you'll hear that. Uh, and so many people, they think, you, you know, you've got to be really stirred up. And then, no, God will hear you. I, I've often found that God speaks to me, not when I'm actually concentrating on him, but when I'm at peace doing something He'll come along and start talking because he knows that he can get to me when my life is at peace. But most Christians, they have this idea that there has to be a trauma. You've got to, whoa, I've got goosebumps up and down my arms. <laughs> I feel the power. In that cases, that's not God. You know, I've got, oh, I've got this warm feeling running down my leg, yeah, but it's not God. Um, you know, I've got it. The people have come out with all sorts of crazy, you know, ooh, ooh, oh, I've got this burning in my hands. See a doctor, you've got something wrong. Um, they, I, I find God just speaks <laughs> when the wind ceased, when the fire's gone. Then there's a still small voice. You're at peace. And if you can get people to believe that, what the Bible teaches, then it's easy. But the trouble is that Pentecostalism has got people that they feel they can't meet God unless they have an emotional freak out. And they get, oh. And they sing the songs and they get worked up. Oh, i got to love you more. I'm desperate for you, Lord. No, I'm not. You live in me. I know where you are. Uh, and there's a peace of God. And that, then God can speak to you. Because your intelligence and your mind can't function when you're emotionally hyped. And that's what most um, people do. You know, when they want to take a collection, these crooks that call themselves Christians, they want to hype you up first. Shout hallelujah. Lift your right arm. Lift your left arm. Lift both feet. You know, gah, run. You know, that's to it. Blah, throw. Yeah. And, and, you know, they, they're getting, they're not getting a logical, rational decision from you because God is in charge of your life. They've hyped you up into an emotional state. And that's what they do on adverts, on television. How often do you see on television you know, kids with runny noses, flies all in their eyes and stuff. And, you know, women um, starving. And they put this in and they say, two pounds will save them. No, it'll pay for the advert on the television. Won't save anyone. Because the crooks in government have got enough money. You know, some of the African leaders could pay off the whole debt of Africa out of their Swiss bank accounts. Don't kid yourself. You know, these, these guys are crooks. They're misleading. I remember my dear friend Archbishop Ederholzer said he gets so angry when he saw those kind of adverts portraying Africa like that. It isn't like that. The only reason it's like that is because of man's corruption. <coughs> and then you get the people go. And do you know, in South Africa they used to do it to destroy apartheid. They used to go into South Africa and they'd throw sweets on the rubbish dump so the kids would go looking for the sweets. And then they'd pretend that they were actually filming something that was, um, you know, a desperate need of children. Or over in Northern Ireland, where they'd give brown envelopes, some of the journalists give brown envelopes out with a five pound note in to the kids to go and throw stones at the troops. And, it, and that's why the cameras were there, ready for them, because they'd been paid to do it. 
and then they were reporting the troubles in Northern Ireland. It's evil. And they, they, they want to persuade people it's some way a truth. It's not a truth. And Christianity is about peaceful, loving, rational, in God's terms, rational, non-emotional. If you come and, and you're full of emotion, and you're full of, you're not going to repent. Why? Because you're so stirred up emotionally. Now, there is a time when you realize the horror of sin, you might shed a few tears. Uh, if you've got in a mess, you'll shed a few tears. But basically, you've got to come down in the quietness and the stillness to realize, hey, my life's got to change. Mortify, therefore, your members that are upon the earth. Got to put them to death. And then he goes on. You know, and and it, it, it's a very rational way of dealing with things. Strongholds of Satan are in the mind. And while you're full of emotion, you don't make any rational decision. How often have you got very emotional and you'll actually shout for the crook? You know, I've watched football matches and I, I'm, I prefer, you know, a side with integrity called Tottenham. Um, and I can't stand the thugs of Manchester United or, or these other ones, you know. But I like to watch good football. Um, and and the, the amazing thing is, though, if you're emotionally attached to a team, it doesn't matter what they do, you'll justify them. And that's your emotion working. But if you were righteous, I mean... You know, that ref, they probably, I, I'm not saying, in my opinion, he was probably bribed to, to send two people off from the opposing team. You know, I mean, it was irrational what he did. Well, one of them was reasonable. But the fact is, you look at it and you think, where's the rationale in that? And in life, emotion has a tremendous power to delude you. You see something and you think it's the answer to everything. It's not at all. It's your emotions caught. And, and that's what God is against. And that's what the Bible's against. You've got to put it to death. Then he goes on. Look, I like it. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. In other words, we're grateful for what God's done. I'm just grateful. Um, and I just stand with gratitude for all he's done. But the one thing I know is, the worst thing you can have is emotion. When you let, that's why anger. You know, there's nothing wrong with being angry. God gets angry. But it says, be angry and sin not. When anger takes control, you do things that you shouldn't do. You become violent that you shouldn't. You'll say things in anger that you don't mean when you settle down. You have to learn. Anger is a gift of God to provoke you to action. But when it takes over, you're in trouble. And, and God wants us to realize that we've got to become in control of ourselves. The, it says in Proverbs, the man who controls his spirit is like a man who overtakes and captures a town. And, and that's in Proverbs. And the important thing to understand is you've got to get control of yourself. That's all he's saying. And, and then you move in love and care. And when you see a brother overtaken in a fault, the thing you do, firstly you restore, you forgive, and you're not there to prove how good you are and how bad they are. You're there to think, there but for the grace of God, go I. Ooh. I've got a capacity to do far worse than that. 
Uh, and, you know, by God's grace, I escape it at times. <laughs> at times, you know. Uh, it's amazing. Control is what Colossians is talking about. Learning. Okay, you are a child of God. Okay, you are redeemed. Okay, you are sitting in heavenly places. Okay, God has done a wonderful work in your life. For goodness sake, let love be the overriding thing in your life. And, and treat people as valuable children of God. God forgave you, you forgive them. You don't hold malice and things. You don't let your emotions get involved. You allow yourself to live a very rational life. And the, the thing is common sense and rationality are so rare in the earth today. People are always finicky. Uh, this, I, I wrote a, something on Facebook about the fact is that you will always be what God intends you to be. And someone's written back uh, four stupid comments. Uh, the first one, you know, oh, you all suffer. And you could tell he's got a little drum to beat, pathetic little drum. And then because I didn't respond to it, he'd put another thing in, bing, 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 bing. Uh, and then because I didn't respond to that, bing, 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 like a little idiot, you know, with a clockwork drumming monkey. Um, boom, boom, you know the things that bounce around. Um, and then he put another comment up, a longer comment. He's not going to provoke me to respond to it. An idiot's an idiot. So let an idiot be an idiot. Now what's he angry about? He's angry because he's got a little idea. And that's the trouble. Schism's caused because someone gets like, oh, you know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Hey, we all make mistakes, don't we? Or occasionally. Well, sometimes. You know, you do something wrong and you think, goodness me, how on earth could I ever have done that? Quite simple. You have a capacity to do anything. But put to death the things that are on earth. And it goes on. Let me just finish with this. Look, it goes on and it says this. Um, verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves to your husband. You know, I was rather amused. I went to... I went down to the golf club, uh, golf driving range, and I'm teaching, um, or, or no, I'm not actually teaching, but I'm encouraging uh, a friend of mine to play golf. And he, he picked up his golf club and said, you know, what's the name of this stick? I said, no, no, no. I said, stick is a thing an African uses to beat his wife. These are called clubs and they're fading a golf ball. And there's a difference between a stick and a club. And <laughs> he laughed and I laughed. Now I didn't mean anything nasty about it, but someone would mm, fancy saying a thing like that. No, if, if, you're, if you're a person with a heart of love, you can have a joke and a laugh. You know, the, the, the prickly people you get around these days, politically correct, you know, fancy saying that to someone. Well, you can have a good laugh at life and you can enjoy one another or you can be one of these legalistic pains. Oh, you know, how could you have said that to me? Simple. And not said with any malice, just a joke, but to try and get someone to stop calling your golf club a stick because <laughs> you, know, you don't need a golf ball with a stick. But um, it's, it's so natural. And, and what I find is we've lost the ability to make room for each other. And the church of Jesus Christ should be a place of love. Where there's room. And, and if you take offence, you've got to forgive. If you quarrel with someone, you've got to sort it out. That's the way a church grows and thrives and survives. And the one thing you don't want is people who are going to always have an axe to grind. 
usually in someone else's back. Um, that is wrong. And so the Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossians, and then he said, wives, you've got to submit to your own husbands. I like that. Um, now, it then makes it very plain um, when it says that, um, you know, that as is fit in the Lord, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. There is nothing worse, and I've seen this, um, where, you know, the brethren, the Plymouth brethren, the men all thought they were superior to the women until they got outside the church anyway. Uh, and they had the women all with head coverings and, you know, woman's not allowed to speak in a church. And, um, but the whole thing, men can get bitter against their wives. Love is a two-way street. Uh, respect and love. Submission, no wife should submit to tyranny. They should get a pair of boxing gloves and thump them. Um, it's just wrong. Um, it's got to be love, and therefore the emphasis is husbands, you've got to love your wives. And um, goes on. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, promote not your children, lest they be discouraged. Now one of the things is, you know, if you, if you discourage your children instead of encouraging them, it's wrong. Then it says, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that the Lord, of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect to persons. In other words, look, don't just... Often I worked in firms where if the boss was around, everyone was diligent and working. The moment he left, they picked up their newspapers and started reading. And you think, come on. Uh, they, they appeared one thing and did another. And what the Lord is saying is, hey, what you do, you serve God. And watch out because God sees everything. And so it's a very practical exhortation by Paul and it's explanatory in itself. So let us love one another. Let us be forgiving. And let us realize we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Let us seek those things which are above. Let us know we're also on earth. And we're human. And we've got to put that to death. We've got to seek to please the Lord in everything. Especially in work. Nothing worse than people who always know better than their boss. That's wrong. We've got to do what's right in God. And either you believe it or you don't. But if you're a Christian if you be risen with Christ. Seek those things which were above. Okay? Is that plain? Yes. Hello? Yeah. You know, you've got to love one another. That's the most important thing. Above all, love. Let's pray. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just pray that your word will work in the heart as full of soap and refining fire to bring us into a peace and love of God and cause us to love one another with a pure heart fervently. Thank you, Jesus, for your truth and for your word. May it do a perfect work in each heart, I pray. Amen.